हेलो हाय गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन सो विल स्टार्ट टुडेज लेक्चर सो इट हैज बीन सम टाइम um so today we'll be discussing neurovascular anatomy part 4 and this is the last part in the neurovascular anatomy topics so today we'll be covering the topic under superficial venous system deep venous system and the vascular supply of the spinal cord and we'll have a look at some practice questions afterwards so coming to a discussion of the superficial venous system of the brain the superficial veins of the brain are divided into four groups uh, there's a superior sagittal group which will drain into the superior sagittal sinus there's a group which is located along the sphenoid ridge that is known as the sphenoidal group that drains into the sphenoparietal sinus or into the cavernous sinus there's a tentorial group which drains into sinuses located along the tentorium and then there's a, there's a deeper falcine group in the midline so that drains into the inferior sagittal sinus and the straight sinus but it will also include the medial midline veins which are draining from the cortex into other structures like the internal cerebral vein the basal vein or the great veins so coming to this superior sagittal group first uh this uh, group of veins basically drains a superior part of the medial and lateral surfaces of the frontal parietal and occipital lobes so superior lobes its medial surface and its lateral surface will draw all drain into the superior sagittal sinus this will also drain uh, the anterior part of the inferior surface of the orbit orbitofrontal lobe so basically the structures which are lying near the superior sagittal sinus will drain into the superior sagittal sinus uh when they are draining into the sinus they form structures called bridging veins and these veins can run freely for 1 to 2 cm between the pyarachnoid and the point where they enter into the superior sagittal sinus and that is the segment known as a bridging vein the second group as we described is a sphenoidal group the sphenoidal group yeah so the sphenoidal group is basically formed by the superficial sylvian veins which are going to run along the uh, sphenoid ridge and even sometimes a deep sylvian veins they will join together and these will form a structure known as a sphenoparietal sinus which is going to run along the inferior border of the sphenoid ridge and this inferior uh, this sphenoparietal sinus most likely ends up draining to the cavernous sinus sometimes it can also drain to other variants known as the sphenobasal and sphenopetrosal sinuses that we will discuss in more detail later this structure as we can imagine since it is running around the sylvian fissure is going to be draining structures around the sylvian fissure the third is a tentorial group which is basically the venous drainage of the basal system of the brain so that includes the temporobasal and the occipital basal veins and the veins which are coming from the lateral surface of the temporal lobe which includes the vein of labia as well these veins will drain into the tentorial uh, venous sinuses this includes the transverse sinus the superior petrosal sinus or the tentorial sinuses there's also as we discussed a falcine group of veins and that is the midline deeper veins located in these regions so they will mostly drain your midline deeper structures like your limbic lobe which includes a cingulate gyrus a parahippocampal gyrus and even other uh, uh, less important uh, limbic lobe gyra like the paraterminal paraorbital gyra and the uncus as well so what happens here is that the veins which are draining the paraterminal and the paraorbital gyra they come together and they form the anterior cerebral vein the anterior cerebral vein ends up joining with the middle cerebral vein and forming the basal vein okay and uh, so this also is part of the falcine group apart from just the inferior sagittal sinus apart from this the veins which are draining the parahippocampal gyrus and the uncus will form the uncal the anterior hippocampal and the medial temporal veins and that will fall that will also drain into the basal vein apart from these the other structures draining into the falcine group include the anterior pericalosal vein and the posterior pericalosal vein and even the uh, occipital lobe at the level of the calcarine fissure to the calcarine vein so these structures mostly will drain as you can see in the falcine group into the inferior sagittal sinus or into the deeper veins including the basal vein the internal cerebral vein and the vein of gallen okay so coming into coming to a little bit of a detail about the sinuses itself the superior sagittal sinus we are all very familiar with it and its structure so it is uh, importantly it is quite narrow anteriorly and as it gains more and more venous drainage it becomes more larger posteriorly so here at the anterior uh, end it may actually communicate with the veins of the nasal cavity through the foramen cecum so that is a point of entry for infections into the sinus and posteriorly it will drain into the transverse sinus of the trochlea 
And it's important to remember that the majority of the superior stress assignments will drain into the right side, but there are times when it can be draining equally on both sides. It is also important to notice what is the configuration of veins and which are draining from the superior surface of the cerebrum into the sagittal sinus and how they angulate. So when it comes, when the veins are coming from frontal poles and more anteriorly, they actually are directed posteriorly. They will form this posterior angle and they will drain into the superior sinus sinus. As we keep going more posteriorly, this angle becomes less and less acute and becomes more right angled. And as we go even more posteriorly, the veins start draining forwards to enter the superior sagittal sinus. The superior sagittal sinus also has large lacunae which can be associated in the vicinity of the sinus itself. And most of these important are located in the posterior frontal and the parietal regions. They are uh, quite void of these structures in the anterior frontal region and the occipital region. So uh, the most of these lacunae that we would see sometimes when we're doing uh, craniotomies in these regions uh, actually end up draining the meningeal veins. They rarely drain the cortical veins. So it might not be that significant if these get injured. Very rarely would cortical veins drain into these venous lacunae in these regions. If they do and if they get injured, then it is significant because the re region being drained by this is usually the parietal and the posterior frontal region. Uh, there are also arachnoid granulations located within these uh, lacunae, and so these are finger-like outpatching the arachnoid cells. They, most of them are located within the lacunae itself. Only a few are actually found in the venous sinus itself, and these can also be seen in other venous sinuses like the transverse sinus, the straight sinus, the superior petrosal, and sphenoparietal sinuses. The superior sagittal sinus uh, is quite obviously triangular in cross section, and it has a and has two lateral angles and one inferior angle. So when the veins are draining into the sinus, they can either join into these angles or they might actually end up entering the lateral wall itself. Some cortical veins may actually drain instead into the lacunae, which are located up to three centimeter lateral to superior sagittal sinus. And then they may drain into the superior sagittal sinus following that. So that is why we usually limit uh, craniotomies, which do not need to expose the sinus to at least three centimeter lateral to the superior sagittal sinus. There are, only, there are two segments, as we already discussed, which receive very few bridging veins, and usually the, the same segments that don't have much lacunae. So this is the frontal region of the superior sagittal sinus in front of the genome of the corpus callosum, and an area of the sinus, which is 4 to 6 centimeter proximal to trochlear. So these two regions have very few bridging veins. Coming to the inferior sagittal sinus, this sinus is running on the inferior border of the fox and it actually originates over the anterior part of the corpus callosum so to anterior to that there is no inferior sagittal sinus that is why when we're usually cutting the fox uh, in uh, bifrontal approaches we don't encounter the sinus uh, it is uh, similar to superior sagittal sinus it's narrow anteriorly and larger posteriorly and it will be formed by the veins that are draining the adjacent region so the fox the corpus callosum the cingulate its most important tributary is the anterior pericalosal vein and an important connection that it might have is with the superior sagittal sinus through the fox. There can be an anastomosis connecting the superior sagittal sinus and inferior sagittal sinus, which can be large enough that the entire sinus from the superior sagittal sinus drains into the inferior sagittal sinus itself. The straight sinus will be formed behind the spinium when the inferior sagittal sinus joins up with the vein of gallon. So the straight sinus is running in the junction of the tentorium and the fox. And this straight sinus actually drains into the left transverse sinus. So the superior sagittal sinus predominantly drains into the right transverse sinus, and then the uh, straight sinus drains predominantly into the left transverse sinus. The transverse sinuses itself are very important structures. So the right transverse sinus will be discussed as you can clearly see it angulates and is draining into the right transverse sinus predominantly. And uh, so this structure is draining. The right transverse sinus drains blood predominantly from the superficial part of the brain because the superior sagittal sinus is draining blood mostly from the convexities and the medial surfaces. The left transverse sinus, on the other hand, is draining blood from the straight sinus, which is draining blood from the inferior internal cerebral veins and the basal vein and the vein of gallon, basically. So the left transverse sinus is draining blood from the deeper structures of the brain. The right transverse sinus is going to be larger. And the transverse sinus will run until it joins up with the superior petrosal sinus, and then it will turn down and form the sigmoid sinus. The cortical veins from the temporal lobe 
as we know, the uh, basal structures directly will drain mostly into the transverse sinus. So they can drain into the transverse sinus, but mostly they drain into the lateral tentorial sinuses that we will discuss later. And these are located within one centimeter of the transverse sinus itself. But the vein of labe here, as we can see, it most commonly will directly enter the transverse sinus. The transverse sinus may communicate with extracranial veins also through emissary veins, as most of the skull sinuses do. The tentorial sinuses, as we had uh, discussed in the previous slide, uh, these are located within one centimeter of the transverse sinus. There's a medial tentorial sinus and a lateral tentorial sinus. The medial sinuses are basically going to be formed by the veins that are draining the superior surface of the cerebellum as over here. And these are going to drain into the structure which is right next to them. So they will drain into the, into the straight sinus. The lateral tentorial sinuses, which are located right next to the transverse sinus, are actually formed by veins that are draining the lateral and basal surfaces of the temporal and the occipital lobes. So these then drain into the transverse sinus and not into the straight sinus. The cavernous sinus has been discussed previously in a previous uh, lecture, which can be accessed online on YouTube. The uh, superior petrosal sinus, on the other hand, it's, a, it's basically an anastomotic connection between the cavernous sinus and the transverse sigmoid junction. It runs exactly where the tentorium attaches to the petrous ridge and actually drains mostly veins from the cerebellum and brain stem rather than from the cerebellum. There are also uh, important sinuses which we can easily get confused with and are not very well understood. There are uh, structures called the sphenoparietal sinuses. So this sphenoparietal sinus is basically a meningeal channel which is running along with the meningeal artery. When above the terion, it runs along with the anterior branch of the middle meningeal artery and then it will go and connect and drain into the superior sterile sinus. When below the terion, it will run below just below the sphenoid ridge that I described previously and then it will drain into the cavernous sinus. The veins which are running right next to it, the superficial sylvian veins, will drain right into the sphenoparietal sinus. But sometimes, uh, as, as we saw here, the sphenoparietal sinus is usually draining into the cavernous sinus, but there can be two variants where they drain elsewhere. So if this sinus drains into the sphenoid emissary veins and pterygoid plexus instead, that is called the sphenobasal sinus. If it drains instead into the superior petrosal sinus, it is known as sphenopetrosal sinus. Okay, so the next important structure we would like to discuss is the anastomotic veins are uh, basically very important named veins which are important to preserve during surgeries. The largest veins on the lateral surface are usually going to be the vein of Trollard and the vein of Labe. These two are veins which are arising from the sylvian veins and draining into the superior sylvian sinus and into the transverse sinus. There are also super, superficial cerebral veins that are also considered as anastomotic veins because these will also drain whatever are the nearby structures in the veins into the sphenoparietal sinuses. So these three structures are always going to be reciprocally related. If one is smaller, the other one will be larger and bigger. Okay, one is bigger, the other two will, are usually smaller. So as we can see here in figure number C, the superior sylvian vein is a lot larger than the other ones and we are not able to clearly make out a trollard or a labe over here. In figure D, on the other hand, the vein of labe is quite prominent and we are not able to clearly make out a vein of trollard and the superficial sylvian veins are not that prominent. The vein of labe uh, has been found to be a lot more dominant in the dominant hemisphere while the vein of trollard is going to be a lot more obvious in the non-dominant hemisphere. The vein of Trollard is also known as a superior anastomotic vein, and it is the largest vein which connects the sylvian fissure with the superior sagittal sinus. So this vein can either correspond to the vein which is running in front of the central sulcus, on the central sulcus, or just behind the central sulcus, and most commonly it is going to be the post-central vein. It uh, usually will join the superior sagittal sinus in a, in a forward angle. As we have discussed, the posterior veins draw, join in a more forward angle. The vein of labe, on the other hand, is known as the inferior anastomotic vein and is the largest channel between the sylvian fissure and the transverse sinus. So it runs posteriorly and inferiorly. It will arise from the middle portion of the sylvian fissure and it will run posteriorly and inferiorly to the transverse sinus. The superficial sylvian vein, on the other hand, is also an anastomotic vein. It arises at the posterior end of the sylvian fissure and it will run in the lips of the fissure and it will end in, by draining into the cavernous sinus or the superior petrosal sinus or sometimes into the sphenoparietal sinuses. Okay, so uh, let's discuss a little bit more detail into the uh, 
structures which are draining veins from the cerebrum itself. So the cortical veins, they are divided into three groups. There is a that's basically the same as the convexities of the cerebrum. So you have the lateral convexity being drained by the lateral veins, the medial surface being drained by the medial veins, and the inferior surface being drained by the inferior veins. The ones uh, which uh, the veins which become quite large, they end up draining directly into the sinuses and they are what call, form bridging veins. Some of these cortical veins may actually not drain into sinuses and they may drain by joining the deep venous system instead. These uh, cortical veins usually join and then they form bridging veins around the margins of the hemisphere. So at the superior margin, that is a junction between the lateral and the medial surface, they will drain into the superior side of the sinus by forming bridging veins there. And at the inferior margin, uh, that is the junction of the inferior and the lateral surface, they will lead to the transverse sinus. Okay, so the frontal lobe is drained by three group of veins. There is a lateral frontal vein, there's a medial frontal vein, and there's an inferior frontal vein. So lateral frontal veins, uh, as we can see here, they have two groups. They have an ascending group, which drains into the superior sagittal sinus, and a descending group draining into the sylvian vein. So these are all named structures, which we already have to memorize just to know what they could be. These include the frontopolar, the anterior, middle, and posterior frontal veins, the precentral veins, and central veins. They're named just like the arteries, of which are the, uh, the branches of the MC, as we had discussed previously. Uh, and descending veins, which are known as the frontal sylvian veins, draining into the sylvian uh, veins here. There are also medial frontal veins, and these also similar to the lateral frontal veins, drain into the ascending group, which drains into the superior sagittal sinus, and a descending group, draining which drains into the basal veins or the deeper veins. So ascending groups are also similarly named to the artery. So the anterior medial, central medial, and posterior medial frontal and paracentral vein group, which is the ascending group, draining into the superior sagittal sinus, and there's also a descending group which will drain into the basal veins. So these are usually the more deeper veins, the anterior pericolosal, the paraterminal, and the anterior cerebral veins. The inferior frontal veins, on the other hand, are going to drain the orbitofrontal surface. So as we uh, saw, the anterior part of the orbitofrontal surface is quite close to superior sagittal sinus. So the anterior veins will drain into superior sagittal sinus, while the posterior veins will drain into the basal vein. The anterior group includes the frontopolar vein and the anterior orbitofrontal vein, while the posterior group includes the posterior orbitofrontal vein and the olfactory vein. And these two veins actually join at the anterior perforated substance and uh, form the basal vein. The parietal lobe, on the other hand, also has of uh, two groups of veins, the lateral parietal veins and the medial parietal veins. So similar to what was happening with frontal lobes, there's again an ascending group and there's a descending group. So as we can imagine, in both the lateral and the medial parietal veins, your ascending group drains into the superior sagittal sinus. But on the lateral parietal veins, the descending group will drain into the sylvian veins. And in the medial parietal veins, the descending group will drain into the vein of gallon. Right, so they're similarly named as the arteries. In the med medial parietal veins, the descending vein, which is important, is a posterior pericarosal vein. Okay, so that is going to drain into the uh, vein of gallon itself. The temporal lobe also has two group of veins. There is a lateral temporal veins and the inferior temporal veins. So the lateral temporal veins also have an ascending and a descending group. But as we can imagine, the ascending group of the temporal veins instead should drain into the sylvian vein and not into the superior sinus sinus. The descending group, on the other hand, will drain into the lateral tentorial sinuses, unless it is the vein of labae, which will directly drain into the transverse sinus. The inferior temporal veins, on the other hand, have a lateral group and a medial group. So the lateral group, as is obvious, which should drain into the tentorial sinuses. While the medial group is obviously going to drain into the structure, which is closer to it. So that is going to drain into your uh, basal veins and uh, your internal cerebral veins. The occipital lobe is also quite similar to the other structure. So it also got a lateral, medial, and inferior occipital veins, which will all drain into nearby structures. So similarly, into the lateral tentorial sinus and the deeper uh, venous structures like the vein of gallon. Right. Coming to the meningeal veins, the meningeal veins are venous sinuses, which basically course along the meningeal arteries. So actually, bit, uh, in the dura, between the artery and the bone, the meningeal veins will overlie the artery. So they get compressed by the artery from below, which makes which is what makes it clear there are two channels running alongside the artery, but there's only one venous sinus there. These meningeal veins, the upper veins will directly drain into the superior sagittal sinus, but the lower veins will drain into the dural sinus, which are present along the cranial veins, base. 
The vein along the anterior MMA branch, as we discussed previously, is what forms the sphenoparietal sinus, and the vein which is along the posterior MMA branch will lead into the transverse sinus. A lot of these meningeal veins actually receive diploic veins from the calvarium. Right, so that was the discussion of the superficial venous system, and I hope that you understood a significant part of it. It's not very complicated, it's just the basic idea is that the way you just you should just imagine where is the structure located and it's quite obvious to understand that where, where should it drain whatever is the closest venous sinus to that region is most likely where it's going to drain coming to the deep vein system this is slightly more complicated and a little bit uh, more difficult to understand but we'll try to simplify it as much as possible so the deep veins uh they basically drain the deep white matter and or whatever is the deep nuclei and the deep gray matter which is surrounding these ventricles so these deep veins are basically, uh, all of them are named. So the important ones are the internal cerebral veins, the basal veins, and the great veins. And everything else basically drains into these three veins. So the deep veins are divided into veins which are directly draining the ventricle. And then there's a separate cisternal group. So there's a ventricular group and a cisternal group. So coming to the ventricular group, the ventricular veins are basically uh, present within the ventricle. So they arise from tributaries which will drain the structures which are next to the ventricle itself and they will also be draining the ventricle as well. So all the structures next to the ventricle like the basal ganglia, the thalamus, the internal capsule, the corpus callosum, the septum pellucidum, and the deep white matter will be drained by these ventricle veins. They will all converge on the lateral edge of the lateral ventricle and they will form two groups, the medial and a lateral ventricular vein group. Now it is, it's not that uh, difficult. Basically the lateral group it drains the lateral wall. So if, for example, if we look at this as a body of the lateral ventricle, so the med the lateral group, it is just going to drain this lateral wall. It is going to drain the floor. Okay, so that is a lateral group. Okay, and then there's a medial group, which is going to drain the roof and it is going to drain the medial wall. Okay, but the important thing is that these lateral group of veins and medial group of veins, both of them are going to exit through the choroidal fissure itself. The lateral group is going to exit on the thalamic side of the choroidal fissure, while the medial group is going to ex exit on the fornicial side of the choroidal fissure. But both of them are ex exiting through the same structure, the choroidal fissure. Right, so uh, they will join near the choroidal fissure and they will form common stems which will drain into the deep veins, that is the internal cerebral, basal, and great veins. The frontal horn in the body, as is quite obvious, would drain into the internal cerebral vein. The temporal horn, on the other hand, because it is next, right next to the choroidal fissure and the basal vein, should drain into the basal vein in the crural and the ambient cisterns. While, as we know, the atrium is right next to the quadrigeminal cistern. So, through the choroidal fissure, it can drain again into the internal cerebral vein, the basal, and the great veins right there. Right. So, coming to the different ventricular group of veins, the frontal horn, as, as we discussed, all the different ventricular groups will have a medial group and a lateral group. Both of them are going to end up running through the choroidal fissure and exiting. So the medial group in the frontal horn is basically the anterior septal vein. The anterior septal vein is what has to join up with the thalamostriate vein and form the internal cerebral vein. So here we can see this is the frontal horn and this is the foramen of Monroe and this is the anterior septal vein. Okay, and this is going along with the thalamostriate vein and at this point it is going to turn back and run in the roof of the third ventricle to form the internal cerebral vein. The lateral group on the frontal horn is the anterior caudate vein and that is going to end up draining into the thalamostriate or the thalamocaudate vein. The body on the other hand uh, has uh, also got a medial group and a lateral group. So the medial group is basically the posterior septal vein and will also go and drain into the internal, internal cerebral vein by opening through the choroidal fissure. The lateral group has got three veins, that is the thalamostriate vein, the thalamocaudate vein, and the posterior caudate vein. The thalamostriate vein is the most important one of these, and it runs in the sulcus between the uh, thalamus and the um, caudate nucleus, known as the striothalamic sulcus. This vein will, as we saw, is going to 
uh, run posteriorly at the posterior border of foramen, uh, of foramen of Monroe and join with the anterior septal vein to form the internal cerebral vein. This junction between the thalamostrite and the internal cerebral vein ends up forming an acute angle and that is known as a venous angle and that is an important structure on angiography. So as Previously, when we did not have CT and MRI, the structure was used to identify the posterior edge of the foramen of Monroe. So the venous angle is located between 0 to 6 millimeters of this posterior edge of the foramen of Monroe as seen on DSA. There's also another important structure on the lateral surface that is the thalamochorid vein. It can run on the medial surface of the chorid and thalamus. And actually, it has a reciprocal relationship with the thalamostriate vein. This, on the other hand, will uh, exit through the choroidal fissure and end up in the internal cerebral vein directly. The posterior chorioid vein, on the other hand, will drain into the thalamostrite or thalamochorioid vein. The atrium and the occipital on also has a medial group and a lateral group of veins, and they will both pass through the choroidal fissure and they will drain into the veins in the quadrigeminal system. The temporal horn, on the other hand, uh, drains uh, separately. So there is a medial group of vein and a lateral group of vein, even the temporal horn. And in the temporal horn, as we discussed, the medial group is always going to drain the roof. And that is the the veins here are the inferior ventricular vein and the amygdalar vein. The lateral group, on the other hand, is going to drain the floor. And here, these veins are known as the transverse hippocampal veins. This inferior ventricular vein is going to go through the choroidal fissure and end in the basal vein. The amygdalar vein is going to drain the anterior wall where the amygdala is located and then it will also end up in the inferior ventricular vein or the basal vein. The transverse hippocampal veins on the other hand, they run on the floor of the temporal horn and they actually exit between the fimbria and the dentine gyrus, so not through the choroidal fissure, between the fimbria and the dentine gyrus and they drain into larger structures known as the anterior and posterior longitudinal hippocampal veins. These also do end up draining into the basal vein itself but there's a slightly longer route. Right. So the there are also other important such as supplying the choroid plexus. So that is the choroidal veins, the superior and inferior choroidal vein. The superior choroidal vein is going to be supplying basically the superior part of the choroid plexus of the body of the lateral ventricle. And it will drain into through the foramen of Monroe and to the internal cerebral vein or the thalamostriate vein. The inferior vein, on the other hand, basically supplies a temporal horn choroid plexus, and that is going to tend, end up draining into the basal vein itself. So these two anastomos have the glomus of the choroid plexus located in the atrium. Right. Uh, the most important ventricular group of veins is the internal cerebral vein. The internal cerebral vein is formed just behind the foramen of Monroe, as we saw at the venous angle, by the uh, fusion of the anterior septal vein and the thalamostriate vein. After these two join, they run posteriorly in the roof of the third ventricle, okay, between uh, the two layers of the telochoroidea in the roof of the third ventricle and uh, just adjacent to the medial posterior choroidal artery. So you can see the two internal cerebral veins over here. This, uh, these have basically anteriorly got a convex upward curve and then posteriorly a concave upward curve which will curve around the spinium. There are multiple veins which drain into this ventricular group. There's an anterior, there's, as we know, the two veins which are most important are the anterior septal and thalamostriate veins. But a lot of other veins in nearby are also going to end up draining into the ventricular, into the internal cerebral vein. Coming to the cisternal groups of veins instead, uh, the cisternal group of veins is divided into three uh, regions, the anterior incisural, the middle incisural, and the posterior incisural region. So the anterior incisural region, basically these veins, uh, there are a number of veins which will converse at, con sorry, converge at the uh, area of the anterior perforated substance and they will form the basal vein. So uh, basically the anterior cerebral vein, as we can see over here, is going to join up with this structure over here, that is a deep middle cerebral vein and form the basal vein. The uh, anterior segment of the basal vein, that is the anterior incisor region, will receive multiple tributaries. Importantly, the deep middle cerebral vein, because it is formed by that, and the anterior cerebral vein, but also it receives the insular vein, the orbitofrontal and the olfactory vein, and other nearby veins like the, uh, the uncle vein and the peduncular vein and the inferior striate veins. The middle incisor region, on the other hand, is a part of the basal vein, which is wrapping itself around the brainstem. So this is running through the crural and the ambient system, and so it is going to receive uh, drainage from two important from the brainstem as well as from the temporal horn. So its tributaries include the inferior ventricular vein, the anterior longitudinal hippocampal veins, 
the anterior hippocampal vein, the mesencephalic vein, and even some medial temporal veins. The posterior incisural region, on the other hand, is the most complex venous anatomy that exists in the brain. So here what happens is that the internal cerebral veins they will exit the velum interpositum and then they will join together and they will form the vein of Gallen. Right, so the vein of Gallen is nothing but the fusion of the two internal cerebral veins. The basal vein can end up draining at the point of this junction or it can drain into the internal cerebral vein or it could drain the vein of Gallen. So as we can see here, this is a very complicated looking structure, but this is the vein of Gallen. And here it is being formed by the junction of the internal cerebral veins and the basal veins. All are joining together and forming the vein of gallon. There are other very important tributaries of the vein of gallon. So these include the atrial veins, the posterior longitudinal hippocampal vein, and other nearby veins, the superior vermian vein, the tectal veins, the occipital veins, and others. There are also important thalamic veins which are drained into the deep veins so th the thalamic veins can be divided into superficial and deep veins the deep thalamic veins include an anterior posterior superior and inferior group and the largest group out of these is a superior thalamic vein so most of these veins are going to drain, end up draining into the deep venous system that is the basal vein itself or into the internal cerebral vein the inferior thalamic vein, on the other hand, will exit through the posterior perforate substance and drain into the peduncular vein, which also drains into the basal vein ultimately. Right, so that is about the deep uh, venous drainage of the uh, cerebrum. Now, coming to a discussion of the blood supply of the spinal cord. Okay, so the vascular anatomy of the spinal cord, if you look at it superficially, can seem quite complicated, but just if, if you pay slight attention, it's quite easy to understand and it's actually quite systematic. So, uh, the at every segment of the spine, you get an artery, okay? And this artery is supposed to supply the spinal column, the paraspinal muscles, the dura, the nerve root, and the spinal cord. So at every segment, you have a segmental artery supplying all these structures. The segmental arteries at the level of the or, uh, thoracic region and the upper lumbar region are going to originate as pairs from the aorta itself. Right. So in the thoracic region from the aorta, you get the supreme intercostal artery and the supreme intercostal artery is going to give rise to two to three branches. You get posterior intercostal arteries, which form nine pairs and the subcostal artery, which is one pair. At the lumbar level, you get lumbar segmental arteries as four pairs arising from the aorta itself. Right, so these segmental arteries also have extensive anastomosis between them. The descending aorta is usually always going to be located towards the left of the spinal column. In the thoracic region, it's located much more towards the left. As you come more lower down to in the lumbar region, it becomes slightly more towards the left of the midline. So the left segmental arteries are going to usually arise from the posterior aspect of the aorta. But the right segmental arteries in the upper thoracic region will arise directly from the lateral surface of the aorta. As you come more and more inferiorly, they start arising more from the posterior surface. The segmental arteries are not labeled by the level that they actually originate from, but by rather by the level that they supply. Right, so uh, once these segmental arteries are formed, they're divided into three major trunks. There is a lateral trunk, there's a dorsal trunk, and there's a medial trunk. So this lateral trunk is going to basically form your posterior intercostal or lumbar arteries. The dorsal trunk is going to form your muscular and cutaneous branches, while the medial trunk is what forms a spinal artery. The spinal trunk then enters the spinal canal of each intervertebral foramen, and then after that, it divides into uh, two, two separate structures, you get uh, anterior and posterior spinal canal arteries. These spinal canal arteries are going to only supply the spinal canal. So as we can see here, this is the posterior spinal canal artery and the anterior spinal canal artery. So these supply the vertebral body and the lamina. So they are also known as the retrocorporeal and the pre-laminal artery. So supply the vertebral structure, the ligamental structures and even the dura mater. But they also give rise to a separate branch which supplies the nerve roots as the radicular artery. This supplies the dura and the nerve root at each level. So every segmental artery gives rise to a radicular artery at each level. Okay, but this radicular artery does not necessarily have to supply the spinal cord. But at every single nerve root, you have a radicular artery. 
Now, some of these radical arteries actually go ahead and supply the spinal cord as well. So that is when they're labeled as radical or medullary arteries. As, so as we uh, saw, the uh, thoracic and lumbar regions are predominantly supplied by the aorta, but the cervical region of the spinal cord is supplied by the vertebral artery, the ascending cervical artery, and the deep cervical artery. Right, so once these radical or medullary arteries are arise, they actually end up feeding what are the uh, arterial systems of the spinal cord. So there are basically two arterial systems. There's a longitudinal, there are two longitudinal trunks, the anterior spinal artery and the posterior spinal artery. And there's a pile plexus. The anterior spinal artery is formed at the level of the foramen magnum by branches arising from the intracranial part of the vertebral artery. It will run, there's only, they join together, they form one single anterior spinal artery and it runs in the anterior circles of the spinal cord and descends till the conus medullaris. It is going to be the thinnest in the thoracic cord and thickest in the conus region. So it is important to realize that the ASA, the entire structure is not being fed just by the vertebral artery. It has to be reinforced by multiple radicular medullary arteries at different segments. The radiculomedullary feeders to this anterior spinal artery rise from three main regions, the cervicothoracic, the mid-thoracic, and the thoracolumbar. So between these three regions, you get watershed areas, and the most important one is in the upper thoracic region. So the anterior spinal uh, artery is going to supply the anterior two-thirds of the spinal cord tissue, and this will include your anterior horns, the spinal thalamic, and the corticospinal tract, so the most important tracts of the spinal cord. The most important feeder to this anterior spinal artery is known as the artery of Adam Kivich or the artery radicular medullaris magna and almost always is going to arise between the level of T8 to L2 on the left side. The posterior spinal arteries on the other hand arise from the vertebral artery or the pica and uh, they also arise to the level of the foramen magnum and they, run, and they are actually two trunks and not one trunk and they run on the posterior lateral surface of the cord and the posterior lateral sulcus. Again, similar to ASA, multiple feeders will reinforce the PSA. The PSA, on the other hand, supplies the posterior one third of the cord and that includes your posterior cord and, po and the dorsal gray matter. There's also another important structure known as the arterial basket of conus medullaris, and that is basically an anastomosis happening between the ASAs and the PSAs around the conus medullaris. This is also known as a basket of Lazortis. So you can see this arterial basket of the conus medullaris over here. Apart from these longitudinal trunks, you also get a pile plexus which forms a structure around the entire spinal cord and that is formed by the anastomosis between the ASA and the PSA on the surface of the spinal cord. So this is also known as a vasocorona. And basically it gives perforating branches which will supply the periphery of the spinal cord. Right, so in the intrinsic arterial system which is supplying the spinal cord, there is a centrifugal system or the central system which supplies the central structure of the spinal cord. And the centripetal of the peripheral system, as we already saw, the peripheral system is arising from the base of corona and it is perforating to supply this peripheral structure. <coughs> Excuse me. The centrifugal system of the central system is going to be uh, sulcal arteries that originate from the ASA. They run in the anterior median fissure and they penetrate the cord and then branch centrifugally. <coughs> oh, excuse me. The venous drainage of the spinal cord, on the other hand, uh, there's, uh, it is quite similar to how the arteries are supplying the spinal cord. So you just have to go back in reverse. So the intrinsic, uh, so first you have the intrinsic venous system in which you have sulcal veins, which the which are running in the sulci and they drain into and there are also radial veins which are draining the odd parenchyma and they run out and form a venous ring around the spinal cord so this venous ring forms a superficial venous system the superficial venous system basically has multiple longitudinal structures there's an anterior median vein and there's a posterior median vein but you also have the lateral veins you have uh, two longitudinal structures located laterally as well as an anterior lateral and a posterior lateral trunk as well. So these trunks also drain similarly as we were getting with the arteries into radicular medullary veins. The largest one of these radicular medullary veins is known as uh, the great anterior radicular medullary vein and it is always going to be found in the anterior thoracolumbar region. The radicular medullary veins form uh, is, are all following 
uh, the uh, arteries as well. They will go out from the spinal canal and drain into the vertebral venous plexus, following which they will drain into the intervertebral veins and then into segmental veins and then finally into the ascending lumbar and the azacus vein. So that is about the entirety of the neurovascular anatomy that we are going to discuss. So um, we just couldn't have a small discussion and some practice questions that we of, of the topic that we covered in this lecture. So uh, the answers can be uh, typed into the chat box and I will let you know if you're correct or not. So this is the first question. So in this angiogram, please identify what is labeled as number eight over here. So your options are as follows. Uh, is it the basal vein? Is it the internal cerebral vein? Is it the vein of gallon? Or is it a posterior hippocampal vein? Yeah, so the answers are correct. So this is the internal cerebral vein. Okay, so you can make this out by, uh, if you can see the structure of your the, the unlabeled number six, it's the straight sinus. So as you can see, this structure is running back and it is draining into the straight sinus and basically forming the vein of gallon over here. So this is structure number seven is the vein of gallon, which is forming the straight sinus over here. Okay, so the next question is, can you identify what is number 16? So your options are, is it the thalamostriate vein? Is it a structure known as the venous confluence? Is it the vein of labe? Is it a structure known as the venous angle? Okay, so this is the venous angle as we had discussed on lateral angiography. The structure which is formed by the uh, turning back of the thalamostriate vein to form the internal cerebral vein, that is the venous angle. So this structure number 17 is the thalamostriate vein. Structure number 16 is the venous angle. And the structure number 8 as we discussed is the internal cerebral vein. Okay, so the last question for today, which of the following structures is most likely damaged in this patient who has developed a CVT? So this first of all is a CVT. Okay, and so which of these structures is most likely damaged? So the options are, is it the thalamus triate vein? Is it the basal vein of Rosenthal? Is it the left transverse sinus or is it superior ventricular vein? Okay, so the answer is the left transfer sinus. Uh, it's important to realize that both it, the, da the damage is bilateral and uh, you cannot have the, this bilateral damage from uh, a structure that is only present unilaterally. So a thalamus uh, damage to just thalamus triad vein or basal vein of Rosenthal will not cause bilateral damage. So the left transfer sinus drains the entirety of the deep venous structure. So that is why in this patient, most likely what has been damaged is the left transfer sinus. All right, so that is all for today's class. Thank you so much for attending. If there are any uh, questions, uh, you can leave them in the chat box now or uh, in the feedback, which will be provided later.